Then, so we have defined we have defined uh, the assets, classified those. We have defined and categorized vulnerabilities. Then we have to make sure that those vulnerabilities are not exploited against the assets that we care about, which are more valuable to the organization. So that's going to be the countermeasures. So likewise, in order to provide the appropriate security control, then if required because as i was saying on some on for some assets there is no need to deploy any kind of countermeasures even if those are vulnerable they are let's say uh on they're not they present no value to your company whatsoever so if, if once we have done all of those steps with the assets and vulnerabilities then we have to see what are the available countermeasures to implement in order to uh, protect the valuable assets against uh, against the well-known or unknown attacks due to their vulnerabilities. In order to be able to implement the proper countermeasures, likewise, we have to be able to classify the countermeasures. Now, the classification of countermeasures is being done um, based on a couple of, uh, let's say, inputs. It can either be based on their nature like we can have physical countermeasures like security guards which are going to ask people for identification before they get access to uh, you know the companies um, to, to the company's offices uh, fire and smoke detection systems which those are going to make sure that once uh, fire or smoke is detected in specific locations like data centers then they're going to both alert the, uh, monitor, the the people that monitor the systems, but also they're going to autom automatically take action, like as I was saying, uh, by the by the mean of water systems or gas systems. Uh, they're going to make sure that they stop the uh, the uh, the uh, the problem from happening. So they basically uh, end up removing the smoke from the room or killing the fire um, or keeping the fire from spreading at least. We also have a, a technical countermeasures which is going to be what we're going to speak about mostly in this class of, of course some of them so like firewalls or intrusion prevention systems or VPNs for example and it can also be administrative, administrative which means policies and procedures. Now all of them are let's say equally important because as you're going to speak within a um, couple of slides later on your network is going to be as secure as your weakest link so if the attacker that's the whole challenge the attacker is going to always be challenged if, he, if the attacker wants to gain access to a specific uh, piece of data then his goal is to find out what is the weakest link in your network that allows him to get to get easy access to the data because if for example so again it, we're using the same use case in here if this is the land side and this is the internet side and there you have the attacker connected to the internet and let's say the attacker wants to get his hands on uh, on data which uh, which resides on test server A. If for the attacker to get his hands on that data from the internet, so he has to cross all of the routers, firewalls, switches, IPS systems, uh, host and systems. So if the attacker to get his hands on that data it has to pass too many, let's say, security systems, each of them with their own, let's say, scope in there. It is too much work for the attacker to get access to the data. It might be easier for the attacker to actually show up in the physical location where the server A resides. So to show up physically in that location, for example. and get physical access 
to the device. Or it may be easier for the attacker, instead of going to all of those, let's say, network devices and security technologies, to actually show up also physically at the boundary of of the of uh, at the boundary of the offices so the attacker is going to just show up next door to your company's building and connect try to hijack the wi-fi system because if the attacker gets access to wi-fi in your network then it might have to choose it might have to bypass pretty much not not so many security technologies and countermeasures across its path to the server array. So if he can if he can he get, he, if the attacker can get access in the network via Wi-Fi, then it might happen that between the Wi-Fi system and its target, which is the server array, he might only need to bypass the security systems deployed on that specific server, which is server A. Because maybe across the path between the Wi-Fi system and server A, there are no more uh, auto security solutions implemented other than whatever is, resides on the server A. So the attackers are always gonna uh, wanna choose the easiest way to get access to the network to what they need to. So that's that's what it means that if the, your network is as secure as your weakest link. Because you might think, okay, because this the data on the server is publicly is not publicly available, you might think then the attacker has to come from the internet. So let me put a lot of you know security solutions in the internet so that nobody can get in uh, unless specifically authorized. But then they're gonna buy the as soon as they find out it's too complicated to bypass the security systems from the internet, they're gonna try any means to get somehow in the network via other via other um, let's say inputs like either physically as I was saying or to the Wi-Fi system or to the uh, for example to the powering system because the powering system may be IP connected, so it's gonna find other ways to get in the network at the IP level basically. So in this use case, you may have ended up spending, you know, lots of money to protect this path from being available to the attacker. So you ended up investing a lot of money in the security system so that the attacker, which stands up in here, cannot successfully launch an attack following the internet path. But then you end up providing or implementing no security measures at all or weak security measures for physical access or Wi-Fi access. And then the attacker can exploit those network entrance points to get easy access in the network and then easy access to the data they're looking for. Also, the, the countermeasures can be um, classified based on the attack phase being useful in. Like we can have preventive countermeasures, like the firewall, which blocks all ports being reachable from uh, from the internet, all or let's say blocks all access from the internet to the inside network except specific ones. So that is a preventive uh, countermeasure. It can also be detective, like surveillance camera which means that the surveillance camera doesn't actually block access or doesn't actually prevent an attack from happening, but it can actually, uh, it can actually uh, catch the attack lively as happening. Or they can be corrective. Like for example, when an infected endpoint, when an endpoint got infected, the cleaning procedure uh, need, which needs to be done on that endpoint is called the corrective procedure. So corrective means after the attack has been launched and successfully deployed and once you have detected the attack then what are the corrective measures you need to deploy in order to fix up the problem or in, or in, the, or in this case clean up the endpoint. You also have recovery countermeasures which mostly are a subset of, of the corrective measures like for example system availability after incident so uh, let's take the example with the infected endpoint if the endpoint was infected 
then somebody detected that a specific system that can be the antivirus installed on the endpoint so somebody detected that the antivirus but then somebody has to follow up on the cleaning procedure and has to go grab that endpoint and clean it up with the companies or the organization's procedures but then the recovery uh, the recovery countermeasures is like when do you make that system available again so it, it is going to be one set of countermeasures to correct to clean and affect that endpoint another set of countermeasures to make sure that the system is available let's say 99.9% .9 of the time like what can happen is you may if, if that system is you know it's a highly important system which needs to be available you may run that system in active active or active standby mode so that it's going to be two or multiple devices uh, achieving the same role the same scope with the same data behind behind the scenes and if one system gets compromised then the other systems can actually offer the same service so the fact that once one system got compromised and you have to take any corrective actions on that system it doesn't uh, affect the system availability that's going to be recovery countermeasures which is going to be as i was saying things like high availability like one example of, the, of deploying this like a, uh, a recovery a countermeasure for example if this is your web server test server a which has to be available 99.9% .9 of the times then you may choose to deploy multiple times the same server so the same configuration same services server a1 and a2 so those three servers are identical in nature they offer the same services and have the same content and then in front of the servers you're going to deploy what is called a load balancer so like when somebody wants to access services on that web server is going to actually like let's say P user on test pca so if user on test pca wants to access any kind of services from those from those servers then that user is going to actually access the load balancer what is called the virtual IP address of the load balancer and then the load balancer tests connectivity with all of the available systems that provide those services which is going to be all three servers and it's going to end up redirecting the user or sending the user's request to the first available server which is the server A or to the least let's say occupied server from the list of available servers so in my case when the server, the server A was compromised and I have to take that off of the network to clean it up it means that now when the same user from test PCA is going to be asking for access to the services which are available uh, and which are available and offered by server A then what's going to happen is the same thing the user is going to actually access the virtual IP of the load balancer and then the load balancer now is going to detect that server A is no longer in the network it has been removed physically to be cleaned up cleaned up but it's seen that it sees that a servers A1 and A2 are actually available so it's going to send the, the user's request to the next available server which is going to be server A1.